Assalamu alaikum. In many of Apostate Prophet's recent videos, he's simply parroting Christian missionary arguments against Islam. This might be due to the fact that he's recently befriended David Wood and Sam Shimon and some other anti-Islam Christian missionaries. Or it might be because Apostate Prophet's secular arguments against Islam have so effectively and completely been dismantled and destroyed in that debate that he had with Daniel Hakikaju, mashallah. For whatever reason, Apostate Prophet is simply copying, repeating, parroting very commonly used Christian arguments against Islam, which is a very strange thing for an atheist to do. It's also a very disingenuous thing for an atheist to do. For an atheist to argue that Islam is false because it doesn't agree with the Bible, that argument is based on Christian presuppositions which an atheist by definition simply does not hold. In one of his recent videos, Apostate Prophet argued that because the Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not use the Hebrew word for God, Yahweh, that shows that he was not from the same God that spoke to Moses and that spoke to Jesus. In that same video, Apostate Prophet also argues that because neither the Quran nor the Prophet Muhammad ever enumerated the Ten Commandments in a specific list or in a unified list, that too is evidence that Islam is not from the same God of Moses and the God of Jesus. So in this video, I'm going to be responding to both Apostate Prophet and the points that he makes in the video. I'm simply using Apostate Prophet's video as a template to which to respond to. But in fact, this video will be relevant for many of you who might have Christian colleagues, co-workers, friends, fellow students at college, at university, at work, who bring up these two specific points. If Islam is from the same God that spoke to Moses, how come the Quran did not use the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh? And how come the Quran does not reproduce exactly the Ten Commandments in that same specific order as it appears in the list in the Old Testament? Let's get started. When speaking of Abrahamic religion, people majorly speak of three religions. People majorly speak of three. People majorly speak of three. People majorly speak of three. People majorly speak of three religions. I don't know if that's proper English, but if it is, then that word majorly is minorly used in the way that apostate prophet used it. The Ten Commandments are fundamental rules essential to the history and ethics of both Christianity and Judaism. You would expect that Islam, which has also claimed to be an Abrahamic religion from the same God, the same books, and the same prophets, would also give great importance to these fundamental rules. And sometimes you would even think that it does, because Muslims do speak of the Ten Commandments when they recall the story of Moses. The problem is that Islam doesn't give us any information about the Ten Commandments. It seems that Islam is rather ignorant about this topic. I would love to ask Muslims the question, what are the Ten Commandments? Can you count them? Oh, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not murder, you shall not steal? Interesting. In which Islamic text did you find that? It was not in an Islamic text? You found it in the Bible? Okay, I want to start with the most obvious point, which is a disclaimer. And this is very important for Muslims to understand. And that is that we do not need to reconcile Islam with the Bible. As has been said many, many times over, Muslims believe that the Bible has been changed. The Bible has been corrupted. Even Christians agree with that. If you ask Catholics why the Protestants have a different Bible, what will they say? They will say they changed it. They tampered with it. They edited it. They messed it up. And if you ask the Protestants why Catholics have a different Bible, they will say the same thing. Protestants will say they changed it. The Catholics changed it. They tampered it. They messed it up. Between the two of them, they would argue that the Ethiopian Christians and the Assyrian Chaldean Christians and the Jacobite Syrian Christians in India, all of them also tampered and changed the Bible. They put things in and they took things out. So Christians amongst themselves actually agree that people have been playing around with the text of the Bible and they have been changing it and large numbers of professed Christians have tampered with the Bible. This subject has been tackled in many, many articles, books, essays, videos, lectures, YouTube videos, debates, etc. So I'm not going to reproduce all of those points here, but it's just important to keep in mind 
that Muslims believe that the Bible has been changed and tampered with. Therefore, not everything in the Bible is reliable. So there is no need for us to have to use the Bible to try to validate Islamic beliefs. What's new in all of this for me is actually an atheist using these Christian arguments against Islam. Is this really apostate prophet talking or is this David Wood or Sam Shimon with the mask of apostate prophet talking? Let's move on. Islam can give you no information on what the Ten Commandments are. In fact, it can't even mention that there are Ten Commandments. All that it can say is that Moses was given something by God. Excuse me, Allah. So think about this. Moses and the Ten Commandments are an essential part of Abrahamic monotheistic religion. A fundamental part of the history of religion, of morality, of the law. But it is absent in Islam and Muslims have to look at the corrupt Bible to find out about their existence. Okay, so this is the main argument by apostate prophet and we will deal with this. Apostate prophet says very clearly in these two clips that I shared with you that Islam says nothing about the Ten Commandments. It does not know what these Ten Commandments are and Islam does not reproduce these Ten Commandments. And you, a Muslim, cannot know of any of these commandments unless they look to the corrupted Bible. Within the Islamic sources themselves, you cannot find these commandments. Apostate Prophet very clearly has said that. According to the biblical tradition, the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on the Mount of Sinai after the Israelites escaped from Egypt, where they were enslaved. God communicated with Moses directly, made Moses lead his people out of Egypt, cut off the enemies that followed them, and on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, followed by God's covenant agreement with the Israelites. This journey is described in so much detail in the Bible. So this is very important. The Ten Commandments are preceded by God's statement in the Old Testament, in the Torah, that he is the God that brought Moses out of Egypt. And this is a very important point to share with the non-Muslim viewers who are watching this in case you don't know the story of the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and his Israelite followers being rescued by God and being rescued from captivity in Egypt is given in the Quran, mostly in chapter 2. If you read chapter 2, which is called Surah Baqarah, you will find this story to be there. Apostate Prophet says that this story is given in a lot of detail in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. Interestingly, however, the Old Testament version, the biblical version of this story leaves out a very important and a very interesting historical detail, which only the Quran captures. In the Quran, in chapter 10, verse 92, it says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, fal yawma nunajjika bi badanika. God says to the Pharaoh when he's drowning in the sea, that this day I am going to save or preserve your body, your badan, your body. Why? As a sign for later generations. Liman khalfaka ayah. For those who will come after you as a sign, as a proof, as a evidence. Wa inna kathiram minan nasi an ayatina la ghafilun. But most of humankind are heedless or are forgetful or careless. They don't care about these signs, about these evidences that we have preserved. Now, what's so interesting about this Quranic statement, which is not to be found in the Torah, it is not to be found in Exodus in the Bible, is that Jewish and Christian scholars generally identify the Pharaoh at the time of Moses to be Ramesses II. In the famous film, The Ten Commandments with Charles Heston, the Pharaoh is also identified as being Ramesses II. What's interesting about that is that only around a century ago, they discovered the mummified remains of Ramesses II. Someone could respond to this and say that, well, it's, it's no big deal. It's nothing miraculous that the body of Ramesses II was preserved and mummified because that is something that was generally done with the Pharaohs of Egypt. Most of the Pharaohs of Egypt were in fact mummified. So there's nothing out of the ordinary or strange here if Ramesses II was also mummified. But my response to this is that when somebody drowns in a sea, when somebody drowns in the ocean, you cannot take it for granted that that body is going to be recovered. If we go by the story in the Old Testament and the Red Sea closes in on the Egyptians and on Pharaoh, 
there would have been complete chaos, there would have been complete confusion in that chaos and confusion for the Egyptian soldiers to somehow save the body of Ramesses II. This is not something that we can simply take for granted. The other point is that most of these pharaohs are probably missing, their mummies are probably missing because in the centuries that have elapsed since their death, tomb raiders have, uh, well, they have raided tombs and they have stolen the mummies, they have stolen the bodies of these pharaohs, they have stolen their personal items, their coffins or sarcophagus or what have you. So how would the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the 7th century, living in the Arabian desert, not having ever visited Egypt, how would he know that in future centuries, the mummy of Ramesses II would be discovered, it would have been undisturbed by tomb raiders for all those centuries and the mummy would be put on display in the Egyptian museum in Cairo, Egypt. Now some of you will say that there's been a lot of research now to show that the pharaoh during the time of Moses was probably not Ramesses II but rather his son Merneptah. Our response to that will be that the mummy of Merneptah the son of Ramesses II is also preserved apparently in the same Egyptian museum in Cairo, Egypt. Like father, like son. But you know what? It is, of course, much poorer in the Quran, where nothing is really being said, except that Allah communicated with Moses on the mountain and gave him the scripture and all things. <laughs> And we wrote for him on the tablets something of all things, instruction and explanation for all things, saying, take them with determination and order your people to take the best of it. I will show you the home of the defiantly disobedient. This is again typical Quran. What the hell is all things? And God told him all things. That's what my three-year-old son says. Mommy, let's buy all things. Seriously, your son says that? <laughs> your son talks like that? Well, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to say that your three-year-old son probably assumes too much of you, apostate prophet. He probably assumes that you are able to contextualize his statement. You are able to contextualize his demand. So what I mean by that is that if your son is, let's say, in the toy section at Walmart and he says, let's buy all things or let's buy everything, he doesn't mean everything as in the kitchen sink, items from the home gardening and the gas station across the street. No, what he probably means in his young mind is why can't we buy all of these toys? In other words, all things or everything refers to all things or everything that is pertinent or that is relevant to your context and your situation. It doesn't have to mean all things. So the Quran is not saying that God revealed the cure for COVID on those tablets that were given to Moses. The Quran is not saying that God revealed the contents of tomorrow morning's newspaper headlines on the tablets given to Moses. But what it means is that God revealed all things that are pertinent or relevant to the salvation of those Israelites at that time on those tablets that were given to Moses, peace be upon him. So since you're piggybacking on Christian arguments using the Bible against Islam, let's reference the Bible. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 14. In that, it is said, they have blown the trumpet. They have made all things ready. That's in the NIV, a very popular translation used by most evangelical Christians in America. They have made all things ready, but no one will go into battle for my wrath is on the whole crowd. The point here is simply to show that all things here means it doesn't mean the Israelites have gotten um, pizza ready. It doesn't mean that the Israelite soldiers have uh, combed their hair and gotten their hair ready. It means all things that are relevant to battle. All the main things that you would need in order to go to battle, they have that ready, but they're still not going to war. So you have to contextualize what is being said here. We wrote on the tablet the lesson to be drawn from all things and the explanation of all things. There were two tablets and what was on the tablets, according to the actual story, were the Ten Commandments, not the explanation of all things on many tablets. 
just question his premises. How does he know that there were only two tablets? How does he know this? Is the Bible 100% clear about this? As we will see later on, there is some discussion surrounding this topic. But even if the Bible were 100% clear that there were only two tablets, you would first have to prove to us that the Bible is true. Only when you have proven that the Bible is true and therefore, Ridwan, you should believe in it and you should be a Jew or a Christian, only once you have shown the Bible to be true can you use that to try to disprove or invalidate what Islam says. Or of course you can take the secular historical route to proving this which is show us the tablets. Show us the tablets. How many are there? And what's written on those tablets? Do you have them? If you don't then we are not going to simply assume that the Bible is true and that Exodus is 100% historically accurate. We will simply look at that as something which could be true or something which could be false. A few verses later, it again refers to the tablets and says that thereon was guidance for those who fear their Lord, but it does again not say what the content was. It's very simple. Two tablets, the Ten Commandments, not some big instructions and explanations to everything, everything, all things. <laughs> Okay, so what were on those tablets according to Jews and Christians and specifically what were on those tablets that are being mentioned in uh, Exodus chapter 24 verse 12, which is the verse that apostate prophet put up there on the screen. I want to bring your attention to Dr. Rabbi David Frankel. Rabbi Frankel or Dr. Frankel did his PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He teaches biblical Hebrew to MA and rabbinical students in Jerusalem. In a very interesting article that he wrote online on the Torah.com entitled, What Did God Write on the Tablets of Stone? He discusses this very same passage that apostate prophet had put up on the screen, which is Exodus 24 verse 12. Here's what he writes. He writes, in my view, Exodus chapter 24 verse 12 has nothing to do with the Decalogue. The Decalogue is simply another term for the Ten Commandments. So he's saying, in my view, Exodus 24, 12 has nothing to do with the Ten Commandments, though later biblical editors apparently so understood it. Rather, it means that God wrote the unspecified teaching and commandment on an unspecified number of tablets and gave this writing to Moses for the purpose of public instruction. So contrary to apostate prophets assumption that all Jews and Christians would simply have the same view on this matter, we see that Dr. Frankel, who is not some marginal, strange, liberal, freelancer, weirdo guy, but a respected rabbi and doctor of philosophy, says that the teaching that was revealed on these tablets in Exodus 24 is unspecified. We don't actually know if this was the Ten Commandments in this instance. And it was on an unspecified number of tablets, not necessarily two tablets only, an unspecified number. Interestingly, in the Quran, when these tablets are mentioned, these tablets which were given by Allah to Musa, to Moses alayhi salam, the Arabic word that is used for the tablets is alwah. Alwah is actually the plural of lawh. In other words, it is an unspecified number of tablets. It's probably not two because it's not the dual uh, case that is being used here, but it is multiple tablets. How many? We don't know. It could be several. It could be 10. It could be a dozen. It's an unspecified number of tablets according to the Quran and according to Islam. Now, just one of the arguments that Rabbi Dr. Frankel puts forward in support of this view is his referencing of another part of the Old Testament, which is 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 37. In that verse, it makes reference to, quote, and the laws and the judgments and the teaching and the commandment that he wrote for you. Why is this relevant to Exodus 24, 12, which we were discussing previously? Because in that passage, it says, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments. It's that exact same phrase that is used in 2 Kings. It's the exact same words, the law and the commandments. I want to show that to you visually here on the screen. So here you have 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 37. You must always be careful to keep the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands that he wrote for you. 
it's the exact same wording, especially when you go back to the Hebrew. So let's replace that expression, the law and commandments in Exodus. Let's replace that there with the original Hebrew words, which are ha Torah wa hamiswa. And in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 37, let's also replace the English words, the laws and commands with the original Hebrew wording that is there. And you can visually just see that, that it is the same wording, ha Torah wa hamiswa, the law and the commands. It's highly unlikely that in 2 Kings, during the time of David, that God would only be asking the Israelites to observe the rules of the Decalogue, in other words, the Ten Commandments. God would not only tell you to observe the Ten Commandments, but during the time of David, it would make more sense that there would be a reminder to observe the whole of the Torah and all of the commandments. Yes, all things that have been revealed in the Torah should be observed by the Israelites during the time of David. The Hebrew is also a clue towards that because it does actually use the word Torah as you can see. Now that can be ambiguous because Torah in Hebrew can refer in, in a generic way to the law or it can refer to the scripture, all of the words in the writing of the Torah. So anyhow, based on this and other arguments, Dr. Rabbi Frankel and other rabbis and other Jewish Christian scholars feel that Exodus chapter 24 verse 12 may be referring to more than just the Ten Commandments and it might be referring to more than just two tablets that were given to Musa alayhi salam by God. Now supposing that historically there were only two tablets that God gave to Moses and supposing that the only commandments that God gave on the stone tablets were those Ten Commandments. Then how would we understand what the Quran is saying when the Quran says that God revealed to Moses on the tablets all things? Well, one way to understand this expression is from a Quranic perspective. Imagine that, trying to understand the Quran from the perspective of the Quran. So let's just have a look at that verse again, Quran chapter 7 verse 145, and we ordained for Moses in the tablets all manner of admonition and instruction concerning all things. Let's use other parts of the Quran to try to understand this part of the Quran. So in chapter 16 verse 89, for example, it uses a very similar kind of wording when God Almighty says, وَنَزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ We have revealed to you the book as an explanation of all things and guidance and mercy and good news for those who submit. So what is meant by the Quran referring to itself as a book that considers within it an explanation of all things? Again, all things doesn't mean how to repair your car. All things doesn't mean how to use video software editing for videos like this. All things means all things that pertain to your salvation, which are necessary for your salvation, which are necessary for you to go to heaven, which are necessary for you to be right with your creator, to be right with God. So if this is what the Quran means when it refers to itself as a book that contains an explanation of all things, then it's reasonable to understand the Quran to mean that whatever was revealed on the stone tablets to Moses, even if it was only 10 commandments, within those 10 commandments, you find the basic principles of what you need for your complete way of life. Within the matrix of the 10 commandments, you will find wisdom concerning all aspects of life, everything that you really need to know to be right with God. Just like in the matrix of the Quran, it contains all things that are necessary for us today in this age as Muslims to know in order to be right with God. The Quran doesn't explain to us exactly how to pray five times a day, but it refers us to the example of the messenger, to the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So based on the Quran, we know we turn to the Sunnah to see the exact details of how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, prayed. In the same way, within the matrix of the Ten Commandments, you find the basic guidance, the basic things that the Israelites needed to know at that time to be right with God, to have the right relationship with God. And there are other similar verses in the Quran like this, where, for example, it says, this message cannot be a fabrication, rather it is a confirmation of previous revelation, a tafsil, Another word, a tafsil, a detailed explanation of all things, a guide and a mercy for people of faith. Now you might say, Sadat, the problem here is that you are taking a Quranic 
understanding and paradigm and you are applying it to the Bible and to Jewish tradition? My response is, of course that's what I'm going to do. I'm an unapologetic Muslim. I'm not going to take the biblical understanding and paradigm and apply that on the Quran. I'm going to take the Quranic understanding and paradigm and apply that to the Bible. However, in this particular instance, I don't want you to think that this is only a Muslim Quranic or Islamic understanding that I am superimposing on the Bible and on Jewish tradition. We can show that this idea exists within Judaism itself. What idea am I talking about again? I'm talking about the idea that the Ten Commandments would contain within them the explanation to all things. It would contain within them hints or allusions to everything else that also needs to be known by necessity in Judaism. Again, just a reminder of the essay that we're discussing. We're discussing the essay by Dr. Rabbi David Frankel of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and what he wrote in his online essay on the Torah.com entitled, What Did God Write on the Tablets of Stone? So in that essay, Dr. Frankel writes about Rashi, who is a, a famous uh, rabbi and Jewish theologian. Rashi explains that the unusual phrase, the teaching and the commandment from Exodus chapter 24, verse 12, is employed with reference to the Decalogue, that is the Ten Commandments, in order to indicate that the Ten Commandments allude to all of the mitzvot. The mitzvot are all the laws, all the, all the commandments, all 613 commandments that are found in the Old Testament, all of the Sharia rules that applied to the Jews in the Old Testament. So according to Rashi, who is kind of like maybe an Imam Ghazali of Judaism, he says that the reasoning that this phrase is there in Exodus 24, the teaching and the commandment, is to allude to the idea that the Ten Commandments contain within them all of the mitzvot. All 613 of the Old Testament laws can be categorized within the umbrella or under the umbrella of these Ten Commandments of the Decalogue. Read that again. The Ten Commandments allude to all of the mitzvot. Dr. Frankel actually quotes from Rashi here within his essay. Rashi writes, all 613 mitzvot are included in the Ten Commandments. Rav Sadia enumerated them in his Azharot, in which he used each one of those Ten Commandments. He used each commandment as a foundation for all the mitzvot that derive from it. So just as Muslims believe that the basis of everything that we need to know is in the Quran, everything in the Sunnah, all of the thick rulings in the Madhahib are derived ultimately from something in the Quran. Similarly, Rashi and Rav Sadia and other medieval rabbis and Jewish scholars believed that each one of the Ten Commandments is a foundation for the mitzvot that derive from it. Dr. Frankel continues and he writes, As support for his reading, Rashi makes reference to Sadia's poem enumerating the mitzvot which categorizes each of the 613 mitzvot under one of the Ten Commandments. Thus, Rashi reads the verse to say, The stone tablets of the Decalogue includes in it the whole Torah, which is to say all the commandments. In this understanding, even though God's personal writing consisted of the Decalogue alone, it is as if God wrote all the commandments, all things, all things, all the commandments, on the tablets of stone. So Rashi, Rav Sadia, a number of Jewish scholars would therefore take exception to apostate prophets' objection to Islam. When apostate prophet says that the actual story in Exodus 24 is of only two tablets containing the Ten Commandments only, not tablets with all things. Let's just highlight that again. Dr. Frankel says that in this understanding, even though God's personal writing consisted of the Ten Commandments alone, it is as if God wrote all the commandments on the tablets of stone. It's just as good. Many Muslim apologists or scholars try to claim that certain parts in the Quran are a direct reference or reiteration or revision of the Ten Commandments. But the Quran neither calls them the Ten Commandments, nor does the Quran's content agree with the Ten Commandments. 
Jews and Christians, and Christians among each other, list and number the Ten Commandments differently, which are found in Exodus and Deuteronomy in the Bible. Okay, so if there are two different lists of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, which one did you want Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to reproduce? Even if the Quran exactly reproduced one of these lists of the Ten Commandments, the fact that there are contradictions within the Old Testament, the fact that there are two different lists of the Ten Commandments, this would already present a problem because then someone could turn around and say, why didn't the Quran reproduce that list as well? In fact, apostate prophet has really oversimplified this problem because the various Christian denominations versus the Jews, they all number the Ten Commandments in a different way. So if apostate prophet is saying that the Quran repeating some of the commandments of the Ten Commandments is not good enough, it has to be reproduced in that same exact list which list exactly is the Quran supposed to reproduce? What is the first commandment exactly? Do all Christians agree on that? What is the fourth commandment exactly? What is the sixth commandment exactly? What is number seven exactly on that list? Do all Christians agree with that? So for the Quran to reproduce the list of the Ten Commandments exactly in a way so as to satisfy all Christians, it would have to reproduce about a dozen different lists of the Ten Commandments. This chart here quickly shows you the, the different ways that the Ten Commandments are uh, numbered depending on which church or denomination you belong to. What's really interesting, however, though, is number 10. I want to bring your attention to commandment number 10. You see, when we get down to number 10, then a Jewish group called the Samaritans that still exist today in Israel in a very small number. And they have a different Torah and they claim that their Torah is more authentic and better preserved than the Torah that the main body of Jews are reading and studying today. In the Samaritan Torah, the Ten Commandment is actually this. You shall set up these stones which I command you today on Mount Gerizim. This 10th commandment according to the Samaritan Torah is wholly absent, is completely absent from the main Jewish Torah that the Christians use today. So again, which list of 10 commandments, which 10 commandments, which one is commandment number 10? In order for the Quran to satisfy everybody, now it would also have to reproduce the list of the 10 commandments as enumerated by, as listed by the Samaritan group in Israel. Now, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're going to argue that because the Quran does not specifically reproduce the list of the Ten Commandments in a specific order, it doesn't mention all ten of them together in one place, therefore the Quran is not from God, what will you say about the fact that Jesus also fails to mention the Ten Commandments together in the New Testament? Christians like to point out that in Matthew chapter 19 verses 18 to 19, Jesus repeats the Ten Commandments. But all Jesus mentions there is, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. I don't even remember loving your neighbor as yourself to being one of those Ten Commandments. So this is the longest list where Jesus mentions the commandments, and there's only five commandments that are accurately mentioned here in this list in Matthew 19. Now, if you're going to say, well, of course Jesus taught that only Yahweh, only one God should be worshipped. He taught that elsewhere in the Gospels. Or, of course, Jesus knew about the Sabbath day being revealed to the Israelites because he mentions that elsewhere in the Gospels. My response will be that apostate prophet, you should apply the same criteria to David Wood's holy book that you apply to the Muslim holy book. If you're saying that mentioning the commandments here and there are not good enough, and we're going to come to that, apostate prophet basically says that. If you're going to say that the Ten Commandments being spread over in different parts of the Quran is not good enough, it has to be listed as Ten Commandments in one place, then it's only fair that we demand the same of Jesus and the New Testament. Where does Jesus mention the Ten Commandments together? Where does he ever use the term the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue or the Ten Words or something like that? He does not. So Ridwan, apostate prophet, you need to go back to David Wood and say, hey, wait a minute here, David, you didn't tell me this. If the Quran failing to mention the Ten Commandments together means that it has failed to mention the Ten Commandments altogether, then by that very same standard, Jesus and the New Testament and Paul in his letters 
failing to mention the Ten Commandments together as one unified list means that the New Testament has failed to mention the Ten Commandments altogether. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make idols. These are in the Quran. The Quran is very aggressive about this issue. Okay, I'm glad that Ridwan, apostate prophet, acknowledges this point. But did he not clearly say earlier on that the Quran is just completely ignorant of the Ten Commandments? It doesn't know what these commandments are. Did Ridwan not say earlier on that Islam in general is ignorant of these commandments? And that the only way that a Muslim can know of any of these commandments is to go back to the Bible. Is he thinking about what he's saying? Was he overstating his point initially? Either way, the wording is not consistent. His thinking is not consistent. Which one is it going to be? Is it going to be this? The problem is that Islam doesn't give us any information about the Ten Commandments. Or is it going to be this? These are in the Quran. The Quran is very aggressive about this issue. The problem is that Islam doesn't give us any information about the Ten Commandments. These are in the Quran. The Quran is very aggressive about this issue. The two contradict. You're also to respect your parents in Islam. That's big. So he acknowledges that the commandment to honor, to respect your father and mother are there in the Quran. They are there in Islam. Killing is not banned in the Ten Commandments and neither is it banned in the Quran. It is murder that is banned, and killing people for leaving Islam, including cutting off their hands and feet from opposite sides or crucifying them, is unfortunately not considered murder. That is just killing, ordered by the dear Prophet Muhammad and his beloved God Allah. So even when he reluctantly acknowledges these points, that the Qur'an also commands Muslims not to murder, he tries to distract from that by throwing out a red herring about the fact that, well, there is capital punishment, you know, you can be executed for certain crimes under Islamic law. And again, the Jews would agree with that. And there's many essays that you can find online that explain that. Otherwise, there would be a contradiction in the Torah. How can the Torah on the one hand give a commandment that you shall not kill, but then it also, for example, orders the killing of people who call to other gods other than Yahweh. God also commands prophets in the Old Testament to go to war. And when you go to war, you don't tickle people into submission, you kill. But as Ridwan explained, and as Jewish scholars have explained, and as Muslim scholars explain, both the Torah and the Quran prohibit murder, not killing. In any event, Ridwan agrees that this point also checks out. The Quran also says that thou shalt not murder. So if that is the case, then why the sensationalist tone and wording at the beginning of his video? Why did he say that the Quran and Islam have no idea about the Ten Commandments? That we don't know what any of these Ten Commandments are? That if we want to find any of these commandments, where will we look? We won't find it in any Muslim Islamic scripture. We will have to go to the Bible. Well, he's contradicting himself now, which I'm glad he's doing. Adultery is also banned in Islam and punished with death. It doesn't matter what it's punished with. It's punished with the same punishment in the Old Testament as well too. The point is that in the Ten Commandments, it says that you shall not commit adultery. And in the Quran, adultery, fornication, which is called zina, is also banned, is also prohibited. Stealing is banned in Islam and punished with having your hands nicely cut off. Again, it doesn't matter what theft is punished with. What matters is that the Ten Commandments say you shall not steal. The Quran also teaches Muslims not to steal. Coveting your neighbor is also forbidden in Islam, and lying is also forbidden. So these parts kind of check out, and these rules also exist in Islam. But as said, the Ten Commandments themselves are missing in Islam. Not only in the Quran, but in Islam altogether. Okay, major contradiction. If these rules, if these commandments check out, because they are found in the Quran as well, then what did apostate prophet mean when he said more than once that these commandments are not found in the Quran and Islam is ignorant of the Ten Commandments? How does this guy make any sense? I am the Lord, your God. This one is already very funny. The actual text says, I am Yahweh, your God. But Yahweh doesn't even exist in Islam. Muslims have no idea who Yahweh is. Their God's name is Allah. So Ridwan is completely piggybacking on Christian missionary arguments here. These are not even Christian arguments that were used 300, 400, 500 years ago against Islam. Christians have only started to use this in the West about a century and a half or two centuries ago. 
as Christians try to reimagine and realign themselves with the Judaic tradition, and especially after the tragedy of the Holocaust, Christians are trying to make overtones towards the Jewish community, while at the same time trying to more effectively proselytize to the Jewish community. So they're trying to emphasize the continuity that, look, Jews have the word Yahweh, and we Christians are also happy to use the word Yahweh. The problem is this, the word Yahweh, the Hebrew word Yahweh, does not actually occur in the Christian Bible, in the Christian New Testament. I'm going to say that again because that's going to shock some of you Christians because you're going to say, what? I'm going to repeat that. The Hebrew word, Yahweh, and I want you to hear that, Yahweh, I want you to hear how that's pronounced. That is not repeated anywhere in the Greek New Testament. Now, if you say, well, we don't expect a Greek scripture to have to repeat a Hebrew word, it's sufficient, it's enough, it's good enough that a Greek scripture simply used the Greek word for God, then we Muslims will say the same thing about the Arabic scripture of the Quran. The Quran being an Arab revelation, having been revealed to its immediate recipients being the Arabs, of course, naturally the Quran would use the Arabic word for God, Allah, which is related to another Hebrew word for God, Eloh, Elohim, because Jews don't only have only one word for God. In Judaism, God has many names. Amongst them are Elohim. Elohim is the plural of Eloh. It's the same word that Jesus uses at the end of Matthew and Mark when he's on the cross. And he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My Eloh, my Eloh, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you left me? So while Matthew and Mark take the trouble of preserving the original uh, Hebrew or Aramaic word of Eloh, they don't make any such effort to preserve the Hebrew word Yahweh. Now at this point, many Christians will quote Jesus from the Gospel of John, where he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they will say, well, I am is the name of God in Hebrew. But I am are two English words. Let's go back to the Greek that John wrote his Gospel in. The words that are attributed, the Greek words that are attributed to Jesus in John's Gospel are ego amy. So ego amy is at best a translation of another name for God, ahye, asher ahye, not even a translation of Yahweh. But if you want to say that a Greek translation of the meaning of the Hebrew name of God is good enough, then we will ask why doesn't it work for the same way with Arabic? Why doesn't it work in the same way for the Quran? If the Quran uses a name for God, which is a proper accurate translation of the meaning of Yahweh, should that not be good enough? In more than one place in the Quran, especially you can see that in Ayatul Kursi, which many Muslims will recite every day. In Ayatul Kursi, Allah is called Al Hay. Al Hay means the ever living, the one who was, the one who is, the one who always will be. And this is the most common meaning that is given to the Hebrew word Yahweh. So al hay in Arabic, which is used as a name for God in the Quran, would then translate the meaning of Yahweh because the name Yahweh is alluding to God's attributes, something about his nature and his essence. He is the one who always exists. He is the ever living. And that is what al hay means in Arabic in the Quran. Let's summarize this using a simple screen. If someone claiming to be a prophet of God does not use the Hebrew word Yahweh, he is a false prophet. Muhammad did not use the Hebrew word Yahweh. Conclusion, Muhammad is not a prophet of God. This is the argument that some Christian missionaries and oddly enough, some atheists like apostate prophet are trying to put forward. The problem with that is that Muslims could use the same argument against Christianity. Muslims can turn around and say, okay, if someone claiming to be a prophet of God does not use the Hebrew word Yahweh, he is a false prophet. Jesus did not use the Hebrew word Yahweh in the New Testament. Therefore, Jesus is not a prophet of God or a Messiah of God or a teacher sent by God or the Son of God or God himself because surely he should know his own name. Christians will use this argument against the Quran. If a book claiming to be from God does not use the Hebrew word Yahweh, it is not a book from God. The Quran did not use the Hebrew word Yahweh, therefore the Quran is not a book from God. The problem is, Muslims could use this exact same argument against the New Testament. 
Muslims could say, okay, if a book claiming to be from God does not use the Hebrew word Yahweh, it is not a book from God. The New Testament did not use the Hebrew word Yahweh. Therefore, the New Testament is not a book from God. Christians, of course, will defend themselves and say, well, look, Jesus said, I am in English, in the original language of the New Testament. He said, ego eimi, and ego eimi is good enough because it's a fair, reasonable translation of what Yahweh, or more accurately, Ahye, means in Hebrew. So that should be good enough. So they say, if a prophet of God uses a fairly accurate translation of the word Yahweh, he is a true prophet or teacher of God. Jesus used a fairly accurate Greek translation of the word Yahweh, ego eimi. Therefore, Jesus is a true prophet of God and son of God and all that. The problem is Muslims can make the same argument for the Prophet Muhammad in defense of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muslims can say, okay, if a prophet of God uses a fairly accurate translation of the word Yahweh, he is a true prophet of God. Muhammad used a fairly accurate Arabic translation of the word Yahweh in Arabic al-hay, which means the ever-living. Therefore, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a true prophet of God. We can apply the same argument to the books. Christians will say in their defense, look, if a book claiming to be from God uses a fairly accurate translation of the word Yahweh, it is a true book of God. The New Testament used a fairly accurate Greek translation of the word Yahweh in Greek ego eimi. Therefore, the New Testament is a true book of God. The problem for those Christian missionaries, of course, is that Muslims can use the exact same argument in defense of the Quran being a true book of God. Muslims can say, okay, if a book claiming to be from God uses a fairly accurate translation of the word Yahweh, it is a true book of God. The Quran used a fairly accurate Arabic translation of the word Yahweh in Arabic Al-Hay, the ever-living. Therefore, the Quran is a true book of God. Let's be consistent, people. You shall not take the name of Yahweh, your God, in vain. Islam doesn't have such a concept of not taking God's name in vain, because God's name, Yahweh, doesn't even exist in Islam, as said, which completely destroys Islam. But I have already presented that and I will do so again and again. The Quran never puts an emphasis on not taking Allah's name in vain, which is why Muslims don't really have such a concept. They're not very careful about the name of Allah. They just randomly use it when they are angry, when they are surprised, happy, whatever. The Quran says, Sabi hisma rabbikal a'la. Glorify the name of your Lord the Most High. So Muslims should try to use God's name in a reverential way. And this is a very good point, actually. I, I do see Muslim youth sometimes, you know, playing basketball and, and they say, Wallahi, you know, one second and then they're swearing the next second and, and all of this is inappropriate. But it's true that Islam does not list using God's name in vain, meaning if we're going to go with this meaning of using it in an empty manner, like using it not in a reverential manner, using God's name, but you're not really thinking about God. In, in other words, the way an atheist would say, oh my God. So when an atheist says, oh my God, there's not even any question of him or her thinking about their creator, right? So there is no such commandment in Islam uh, against this understanding of, of misusing God's name. And I think there's a great wisdom in that because what the scholars of the heart say is that even if your heart is not into it, do dhikr of Allah. Mention God's name because if you keep on mentioning God's name, eventually the heart will join the tongue. So I think there's a great wisdom in using God's name, obviously not in some crass, vulgar kind of way. But we're not always going to have a 100% presence of mind or presence of heart. That should not stop us from developing a habit of using God's name and remembering His name. Because if you remember to say His name, eventually you will remember Allah as well. What's very important to point out here is that apostate prophet is simply making assumptions about Jewish interpretations of this commandment. Not every Jewish or Christian interpretation of this commandment is that, oh, you can't say, oh my God. Uh, unless you're actually thinking and meditating about God. Many, many Jewish scholars and Christian scholars have argued that not taking God's name in vain means not misusing it for an evil cause, like perjury, for example. You take an oath or you say, I swear to God, when in fact you're actually lying. That you are not supposed to do. 
Here's just a very quick reference for you, the Illustrated Dictionary and Concordance of the Bible, edited by Dr. Jeffrey Wigoder. So in this Dictionary and Concordance, for example, the author argues that not using God's name in vain, because you know, why else would you put that in the same list as like, do not murder, do not commit adultery? Or, do you seriously believe that? And if you actually believe that interpretation, do you think that's a reasonable interpretation? That if I say, oh my God, and I wasn't actually thinking of God when I said that, I committed a sin which is just as bad as murder, which is just as bad as theft or adultery. If Islam had taught that, apostate prophet would be making fun of that. <laughs> I mean, I know how apostate prophet thinks now, right? This is the kind of stuff Ridwan would be making fun of. If Muslim scholars got together and gave a fatwa and said, you know, you, if, if you use God's name without actually thinking about God, without actually having awareness of mind and awareness of heart of God when you mention his name, you know, that's just as bad as murder. That's just as bad as adultery. Apostate prophet would have a field day with that, right? Abdullah Samir would have a field day with that. So this is being very, very disingenuous. Now, here, here's another interesting reference for you. This is by Rabbi Joseph Tulushkin. It's called Jewish Literacy. The most important things to know about the Jewish religion, its people, and its history. He makes a very interesting point, and I should actually share that quote with you. I'll read it very fast. The third commandment also has not fared well in English. Okay, he quotes it in Hebrew. It is usually translated as, you shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. Many people think that this means that you have to write God as G-D. Or that it is blasphemous to say words such as God damn. Even if these assumptions are correct, it's still hard to figure out what makes this offense so heinous that it's included in the document that forbids murdering, stealing, idolatry, and adultery. However, the Hebrew words literally mean, you shall not carry God's name in vain. In other words, don't use God as your justification in selfish causes. I want you to pay attention to that point right there. So the rabbi is arguing, don't use God as your justification in selfish causes. He says that's the real meaning of the Hebrew Jewish commandment that thou shalt not take the Lord your God's name in vain. So folks, if we go with this particular Jewish understanding of that commandment, then we will find that idea reproduced in the Quran. The Quran repeats this command because in Surah Baqarah, that is chapter 2, Verse 224, God says, And do not allow your oaths in God's name to hinder you from virtue and righteousness and making peace between people. Let's say I have a relative or a friend or a neighbor who borrows some money from me, and he's done this on a number of occasions. And the last time I was so angry that I say to him, I swear to God, I'm never going to lend you any money ever again. I swear to God, if you ever ask me, I'm never going to lend you any money ever again. What the Quran is saying in chapter 2 verse 224 is that if, if there's a good reason to lend that money to that person, if that person really is in genuine need, do not now use your oath because you swore to God you would never lend money to this person again. Do not use that as an excuse to not do this good deed of lending him money. In this particular case, God allows you to break that oath and there's some kind of kafara, some kind of way of redeeming yourself, of atoning for that. You know, you, you give to charity, you feed the poor, something like that. But go ahead and do the good deed. What if in a moment of anger, I swore to God that I'm never going to pray my five daily prayers ever again? Am I now excused from the five daily prayers for the rest of my life? No, this is not an excuse. In this case, I still have to do what is obligatory. I still have to pray the five daily prayers, but there will be a way of me atoning for that uh, oath that I made, which I now have to break. Tafsir ibn Kathir says pretty much the same thing. You know, do not swear much. And if you have sworn against doing something good, then give an expiation for the oath and do good. That's the word I was looking for, expiation. So there's a way of paying an expiation for the breaking of that oath, but you still have to do that good deed or that deed which may very well be obligatory, like paying zakat or going on hajj if you can afford to do so, etc. Remember the Sabbath day. <laughs> this one is very strange because while the Quran mentions the Sabbath, it says that the Sabbath was only appointed for those who differed over it, meaning the Jews and the Christians. Why? No clue. Probably because they were bad. It's always their fault. Especially the Jews. 
Okay, so in other words, without chasing the red herrings that apostate prophet is throwing out here, the Quran acknowledges that God did reveal the Sabbath for the Bani Israel, for the Israelites, just like the New Testament acknowledges that the Sabbath was revealed for the Israelites, but it's no longer applicable to Christians today. Similarly, Muslims do not believe that the Saturday Sabbath is applicable today in this day and age. But did God reveal it to Musa alayhi salam, to the Israelites? Yes, of course, the Quran acknowledges that. And so what if the Quran says that the Jews differed about it or they fought over aspects or rules concerning the Sabbath? What difference does that make? They can't fight over something that doesn't exist. So the point is the commandment of the Sabbath, of keeping the Sabbath, does exist in the Quran. God acknowledges that this was revealed for the Bani Israel. And how the Quran's reference to the Jews differing about the Sabbath, how that invalidates the basic fact that the Quran makes mention of the Sabbath, I have no idea. Why apostate prophet just cancels that out, I have no idea. Other than apostate prophet thinks all Muslims are bad, it's all the Muslims' fault, it's all the prophet's fault, I, I don't know, no clue. And by the way, it's not only the Quran which is critical of Jews. In Luke chapter 6 verses 1 to 2, it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So here the Quran is actually confirming in this case what is in the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament in the Bible. According to Luke chapter 6, the Jews were differing over how the Sabbath is to be kept. What are the rules concerning the Sabbath? What is allowed? What's not allowed? They got into some very heated disagreements and arguments about this. The Pharisee Jews were at odds with the disciples of Jesus, who were also Jews, about the laws of the Sabbath. So what the Quran says is actually completely accurate. The Jews really differed amongst themselves and argued over the regulations concerning the Sabbath, and they made it more difficult for themselves than was necessary, than was ordained by God. And I know I'm chasing some of those red herrings, but I, you know, I just had to share this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. This is in the New Testament written by Paul. Uh, Paul mentions the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men. So this is a question for your Christian friends, apostate prophet. If the word of God, if the Bible says that the Jews do not please God and they are contrary to all men, well then, I mean, wouldn't God curse them if they don't please God? So even if the hadith that you paraphrased is saying what you think it's saying, even if the prophet Muhammad was saying that God cursed all the Jews, well, you could assume the very same thing here from 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament, that all the Jews are not pleasing to God and they are contrary to all men. What do you make of this? Is this anti-Semitic? Is this anti-Jewish? When you say that according to Islam, everything is the Jews' fault, the Jews are bad, it's all their fault. Well, here's at least one thing that is not the fault of Jews, and that is killing Jesus Christ. Because Muslims believe that Jesus was not killed, that God did not forsake him, that God saved Jesus, peace be upon him. And therefore, no one is to blame, not the Jews, not the Romans. No one is to blame for actually killing Jesus because he was not actually killed. According to Christians, according to Paul, according to First Thessalonians, however, it is their fault. It's the Jews' fault because they killed the Lord Jesus. Muslims have a Friday instead where they go to the mosque and then afterwards they go on with their day. The Sabbath is about resting on the seventh day, like God rested on the seventh day after creating the earth in six days. Muslims reject this idea of the Sabbath because they find it blasphemous that Allah would rest on the seventh day, because God doesn't need to rest. Yet they kept the teaching that God made everything in six days. If resting is considered blasphemy because God doesn't need to rest, then shouldn't the creation in six days also be considered blasphemy because God doesn't need six days to create. He can just do everything immediately as he wishes. How does that make sense? Muslims agree that God can create slowly or God can create in an instant. He can simply say, be and it will be, as the Quran says, kun fayakun. But God choosing to create the heavens and the earth in six stages, I don't see how this shows an imperfection. 
Whereas God getting tired, if we were to take that literally, if we were to take it literally from Genesis that God rested or he needed to rest, the idea of resting clearly denotes some kind of limitation or imperfection in God's nature. And the Quran does not reproduce that wording from the Torah. Thank God for that. Again, all of this is very disingenuous because had the Quran said that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and then he rested on the seventh, surely apostate prophet would not have missed an opportunity to make fun of that. Surely apostate prophet would have said, why does Allah get tired? Why does Allah need to rest? <gasps> so it's a case of do it, you're damned, don't do it, you're damned. Had the Quran simply been a copy of the Old Testament and had it simply lifted or copied, plagiarized this idea of God resting on the seventh day, apostate prophet would have had a field day making fun of that. The Quran wisely omits, the author of the Quran wisely omits this idea of God resting. And now apostate prophet is saying, how come it's not agreeing with the Bible? But what am I talking about? I wish this was the only thing in Islam that doesn't make any sense. Instead, Allah ascended on his throne on the seventh day. Why does Allah ascend on a throne, people? Why does Allah have a throne? Isn't that quite a material thing? Isn't that blasphemous? Does Allah sit? Well, this would only be a material thing if Muslims believed that the throne of God, the Arsh, is a material thing. Then you could say, okay, this is materialism. But even if God had created a throne, a material throne, what would be the problem with God creating a material thing? After all, Muslims, Jews, and Christians believe that God created material. God created the heavens. He created the earth. He created water. So God created material things and he is not in need of any of the material things that he created. So if you want to call that materialism, I mean, what would be the problem with that? Muslims do not believe that God is a physical being who needs to physically rest or sit down on a throne. We just covered that in the previous point. Most of the Sunni Muslim theologians who are Ashari's or Maturidis, they interpret this in a figurative way. God's ascending the Arsh meaning that he has established his dominion and his command. Something to this effect, but it is interpreted in a non-physical way. And the Sunni Muslims who don't interpret it in this figurative way, they do not interpret it in a physical way either. They simply say, be like Kaif, without knowing how God does this, without us understanding the modality or the howness of how it is done. But most Sunni Muslims have understood this to be some kind of figurative language which we don't fully understand. So here in Canada, we would say that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in the seat of power. When we say that Donald Trump is in the seat of power in Washington, it doesn't necessarily have to refer to a physical seat. It simply means he has the power. He has the command. He has the authority. This is yet another point on which apostate prophet Ridwan is being disingenuous. Because had the Quran not made mention to any kind of arsh or throne, then he would have turned around and said, wow, Islam and the Quran is completely ignorant of the idea of the throne because perhaps you forgot or perhaps David Wood forgot to mention to you, Ridwan, that the Bible is full of references to the throne of God, whatever throne of God actually means. Here are some references from the book of Revelation where you will find many of them. And in fact, here in Revelation, you get the most physical or materialistic description of that throne. However, this is uh, what John of Patmos Island sees in a vision or in a dream. So it can be dismissed as uh, something which is uh, highly symbolic. And here you have some more references in the same book of Revelation in the Bible. Here you have uh, references from 1 Kings and Ezekiel. All of these biblical passages talking about a throne of God. In 2 Chronicles, you actually have a very physical description. Again, uh, the throne had six steps and a footstool of gold was attached to it. Where is Allah's throne, by the way? Oh yeah, it is above. Ab above. Imagine an example in a store. I want to complain to the cashier. Uh, she's unable to resolve the problem. So I say, okay, who's above you? Who's the next person up? 
So when we say above you or the next person up, we don't mean that her boss is literally in an office on the higher level of the store. We don't mean that the boss is sitting on her shoulders or on her head, but her boss being above her or her boss being higher than her means higher in the pay scale, higher in a position of authority at work. In the Bible, it says that the head of the woman is the man. The Bible doesn't mean literally that the head of the woman is a man's body or that the man is standing on top of the woman, but it means that in marital life in the household, the husband has a certain degree of authority above the woman. So in all languages, including English, including the many languages that you know, apostate prophet, including German and including Arabic, to be above something can also mean that you are higher in terms of authority. The Bible, however, may give a different answer to your question, Ridwan, of where is God? If he's above us, where exactly is he? Well, which God are you talking about? Are you talking about God the Son or God the Father or God the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost? According to Mark chapter 14, verse 62, God the Father would be on the left side of God the Son because God the Son is seated at the right hand of God the Father. In Revelation chapter 5, it's the same thing. Jesus apparently is seated at the right hand of the throne. So to answer your question, if you were to pose this question to David Wood, God the Father, if that's the God that you're asking about, is sitting on the left side, God the Son is on the right side. And I don't imagine your Christian friends being offended at the idea of the Holy Spirit being directly above God the Father and God the Son, as is illustrated in many, many famous Christian paintings, none of which seem to particularly offend Christians in regards to that point. So yeah, there's a lot of Christian ideas and there's a lot of biblical verses and statements that Islam does not agree with, that Islam does contradict, and thank God for that. And there's many, many other things in the Bible that you might think Islam contradicts when in fact it does not contradict with. Yeah, instead of the Ten Commandments, Islam actually does present some deadly sins, according to which you are not to run from the battlefield. What a religion. This is a, a bit of a change of topic because it is true that running away from the battlefield in cowardice is a sin in Islam. Now, many scholars understand that to mean that this applied during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When you're fighting alongside a prophet of God, when you're fighting alongside a messenger of God for you to abandon him and to flee from the battlefield is a sin. This would be common sense, this would be logical. But when Ridwan says that instead of the Ten Commandments, the Quran has this commandment to not flee from the battlefield, this is not correct. So he's pulling a fast one on you guys. I mean, he could just as easily say that, oh, instead of, uh, instead of thou shalt not murder, the Quran has the commandment to grow your beard if you're a man. Or instead of the commandment of thou shalt not steal, Islam has the command to fast during the month of Ramadan. No, these laws, these rules, these regulations are not instead of those Ten Commandments. These rules and regulations are in addition to the Ten Commandments. As for actually cancelling out or contradicting the Ten Commandments, for that you need to go to Christianity because they start with the very first commandment. The first Jewish commandment, the first Hebrew commandment is to have only one God and you shall have no other God besides me. So where does Jesus come into the picture? Where does the idea of worshipping three persons, where does this Christian idea come into the picture? So Christians should be the last people on earth to ever accuse Muslims of breaking or contradicting or dismissing the Ten Commandments. Ridwan, please go back to your friend David Wood and ask him if he thinks that it's a good thing to be a coward on the battlefield. Is that what the God of the Bible teaches? In Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 22, God actually issues a command to the Israelites, you shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. This is not in some spiritual warfare New Testament sense. This is very much in the context of physical warfare in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 4, the Lord will deliver them to you and you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor 
forsake you. So remember, apostate prophet, being a coward in a secular context is not the same as being a coward in a religious context. Religious Jews, Christians, and Muslims, if they are fighting a just war, believe that God is with them. God is helping them. When God is helping you, why should you be afraid? And why should you allow that fear to overcome you so that you flee from the battlefield? This idea is common to Judaism as it is there in Islam. If you are fighting alongside Moses, if you are fighting alongside Joshua, if you are fighting alongside David, you do not flee and leave them. That is considered a sin in Judaism. <laughs> what a religion, huh? Speaking of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you? So this is a command. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is not talking about spiritual warfare on the internet or making YouTube videos. Joshua chapter 1 is very much in the context of warfare, of the Israelites fighting non-Israelite peoples in the name of God. In Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1, it says, The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. So being courageous, whether on the battlefield or elsewhere, as long as it's for a good cause, is a virtue. That's a good thing in Islam. That's not something I'm ashamed of. That's something I, I believe is right. It's correct. Here's a Christian pastor who says that one of the reason David got into the trouble that he got into with Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba, that whole affair according to the Old Testament, one of the reasons David commits adultery with Bathsheba, according to the Bible, not something that Muslims believe, is because he wasn't at war and he was supposed to be at war. It was the season of war and he didn't accompany his men to the battlefield. He stayed behind and this is the kind of trouble that he got into. This is one of the interpretations that you will see from both Jews and Christians. When do so many of us get messed up? It's when we're not engaged in the battles that we're supposed to fight. Your warriors, every single one of you, male and female warriors, you've got someone to protect. You've got a kingdom to advance. You've got a battle to win. But when we're disengaged from our God-given calling, so often we're vulnerable to the selfish temptations of lust. David should have been leading the charge. He should have been rallying the troops, but he was disengaged. And that's the very reason so many of us are losing this battle. In addition to this, I'm sure if we were to dig deep into the books of Jewish law, we would find agreement with this idea. Remember, Islamic law is not radically different from Jewish law. Moses Maimonides, for example, a famous medieval Jewish theologian, philosopher, and legal specialist said that you cannot excuse yourself from an obligatory war which is commanded by God. So if it is an obligatory jihad, that you cannot excuse yourself from according to Jewish law as understood by Moses Maimonides. Finally, we'll end with a secular example. This one will be relevant for Ridwan and other atheists and agnostics who might be watching. According to the United States Uniform Code of Military Justice, any person found guilty of desertion or attempt to desert shall be punished if the offense is committed in a time of war by death or such other punishment as a court martial may direct. But if the desertion or attempt to desert occurs at any other time by such punishment other than death as a court martial may direct. So, I mean, this is not unheard of people who have fleed the battlefield or who have simply disobeyed the orders of their commanding officers during times of war. These people can expect to be court martialed and punished in some kind of way. This is not a virtuous thing. Even in secular law, throughout World War I, throughout World War II, in the US Civil War, governments killed their own soldiers when those soldiers disobeyed orders on the battlefield or when they deserted their fellow comrades. This is part of secular law. This is part of American law. This is part of America. What a country. Okay, folks, thank you for watching an exceedingly long refutation video. I hope you got something positive out of it. See you next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.